this book together is speaking to you, telling you what you're about to read. And so this is what they say. Dear reader, you're about to read the words of Moses spoken to all Israel. We'll come back to that in the wilderness east of the Jordan. So right where we just showed you on the map in all these places that I am not going to try and pronounce that I don't even know that I could point them out on a map. But anyway, they're in the Jordan River Valley, looking out over the Jordan River to what will become Israel. And the author says, by the way, did you know it takes 11 days to go from um, where we just were to uh, from Mount Horeb to Kadesh Barnea? Um, it was 40 years after that. <laughs> it's like a fun little nod to um, some things have gone wrong along the way. And here we find ourselves 40 years later on what should have been just shy of a two week journey. Moses is going to proclaim to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. So what is that? That's the law. Everything that had just happened, all of the laws that they had been given, we're about to enter into a time of retelling all of that. And by the way, this was after he defeated Sihon, king of Amorite. I mean, they're just kind of giving us some set. They're laying the setting for where this story is going to take place. We are actually going to read this account tonight. You'll read it this week. I believe Wednesday or Thursday. Um, there's a lot of battles where the timeline gets confusing, but you're going to read about all of these battles that he's talking about this very week. So east of the Jordan in this territory of Moab, this setting the stage, Moses begins to expound this law. And I believe we talked about this word expound last week, that the closest definition, it, the Hebrew word is be'er, not beer, I said in the email, be'er, two syllables. And the closest thing that you can kind of connect to this is the idea of an expository sermon. Moses is not just about to talk for his own sake or to give them a whole bunch of information. He, everything that he's about to say from verse six to the end of chapter 33 is said with purpose. It's meant to um, help them actually learn how to live and how to follow God. So then Moses actually begins to speak. It's like the narrator hands over the microphone to Moses. And now from this point to the end of chapter 33, we are hearing the voice of Moses um, speak to us from the pages of Deuteronomy. So verse six, the Lord, our God said to us at Horeb, Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai. And uh, here's one of my favorite lines in this book. You have stayed long enough at this mountain. So at this point, we're in going to retrace the steps of numbers. This is after they've spent a year at Mount Sinai. They have been formed. They've been given the law. They know what they're supposed to do. They know what their mission in the world is. And so now God says, okay, you've been here long enough. It's time for you to actually get up and go do the thing that you are supposed to do. I talked a lot about this um, in the video for this week. I'm not going to rehash it. I, there's a lot of, I think, lessons here for us. How often do we sit, we sit, we sit. We want to learn, we want to learn, we want to learn. There are times, I think, when God's saying, just, it's time to go. Get up and actually go carry out your mission in the world. Um I think Martha would have really liked this. You know, the Mary and Martha story. I think Martha would have liked this a lot. Either way. So now we get this line here in verse eight. They're going to get up and they're going to go out into the wilderness. And God's going to remind them, see, I have given you this land. Go in, take possession of it. So the land the Lord swore he would give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. You know how I like to do it. I think we should just go back and take a look at what is Moses talking about here. This is a callback to Genesis 12, where we first see God calling to Abraham saying, go from your country to the land I'm going to show you. I have carved out a space for you in this world, and I want you to go into it. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great so that you will be a blessing and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. This is so important because again, we talked about this a little bit last week, the Israel 
the law is not meant to be, oh, Israel is so great. You get this land because you guys have done so well in the world. They have messed up every chance they get. And we're going to see that in spades today. The whole point why God continues to work with them is because God has a mission for them in the world. And he's reminding them of what that is and hoping that they will continue to go out into the world and carry it out. So this is a callback to that Genesis 12 moment of you are going out into the world. You're going to get this land. But not just for the heck of it, you're going into this land so that you can be a blessing into the land. Everything you have is for that purpose. You um, you have a job to do. You're on mission, so to speak. And then we get this funny little vignette about leadership. Moses says, you are too heavy a burden for me to carry alone. And I know all of us have echoed those words at some point, whether it's with your kids or your coworkers, I think we can all relate to this feeling of you you got too many people coming at you all the time, needing something from you. And Moses is going to say, by the way, this is a good problem. God has increased your numbers. You've grown so mighty. You are as numerous as the stars in the sky to which your mind should be going ding, 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 ding. I think we've talked about that story a lot. Wh- what? Where is this a callback to? What hyperlink does this go back to? Abraham. Which story of Abraham? We've looked at Genesis 12. It's not His far blessing. from that one. When they commissioned, when he was commissioned, the blessing, the Abrahamic blessing. Yes. So first let's go back to Genesis one, and then we're going to go to that blessing God created mankind in his own image. And then what? He blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. That's the whole, that's part of the whole point. Now, I'm not going to tangent, even though I'm fighting every ounce of my personality not to. This is not just have a bunch of babies. This be fruitful. Just follow our Cultivate series. It ties directly into that. Go produce good fruit and increase in number. That's all I'm going to say about that. And they're doing that. They're they're become as numerous as the stars in the sky, which, as Elizabeth pointed out, is exactly what God told them would happen. Remember this Genesis 15 story, uh, the animals being cut into that weird covenant story we've talked about so many times. Look at what God says. The word of the Lord came to him. This is to Abraham. This man will not be your heir, heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars if you even can. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. This is such a beautiful story because look what happens next. Abraham, Abraham trusts the Lord and it's credited to him as righteousness through his trust in what God is saying, believing that what God is saying is steady and can be relied on, there's a right relationship between Abraham and God. Are we going to read about stories this week where the opposite is true, where the people do not trust God, where they don't know if he's steady and can be believed? Yeah, you bet. That's like one of the number one problems we're going to read about. But this is all setting the stage for this right relationship and the way things are supposed to be. And Israel is right on track. They're they're leaving Mount Sinai. They're numerous and everything is going well. Um, so what is Moses going to do now that the numbers have increased and the people are too much for him alone? They're going to choose some wise, understanding and respected men. Okay, a couple of notes about these words wise, you could translate as like skillful. Okay. They know what they're doing. Understanding a word that we can relate to this is discerning. They have the intellectual understanding. So skilled they're they've got discernment in them. Respected means known. They have some reputation. These are not strangers. They are men who have been tried and tested. And now I am not a Hebrew scholar. I mean, Elizabeth talked about this. She's way more of one than I am. And I am very biased as a woman. I'm just going to put that out there, laying all my cards on the table. This word in Hebrew that is used here for men is 
is the same word that's also used for mankind in other places, including in Deuteronomy and Exodus. It's used to represent both genders. Okay. So the, in all likelihood, this could be just talking about men, but at the same time, there it, it also could be talking about just respected people. In fact, there are a couple of translations, the CEB, the NRSV, and one other who render this humans or people or individuals. Okay. So I, this is one of those times when, um, the translations do us a little bit of a disservice, I think by just putting men, because it's not clear to me from the context that that's what they're talking about. Does this make sense? Um, I can't say for certain, but I also can't say for certain that it is limited to one gender. Regardless, I think it's important for us to look at the character traits that they are trying to pull out here of these, these men. They're going to be laid out as commanders. This word has military connotations, officials like civil um, representatives, and then judges, with, when you put these three words together, what you see is a full society starting to take place. And again, this is good. The whole point was for the nation of Israel to become a governing nation. And so you see the bones being put in place by that. And God says, or Moses says um, on behalf of God, these are the things you are to keep in mind as you govern these leaders. Judge fairly. Don't show partiality. Don't prefer one person over another and don't be afraid of anyone. And by the way, when he says judge fairly, it's not just for the Israelites among them, but the foreigners too, to which your mind should be going, huh? Okay. Where have we read language like that before? And the answer is in your favorite book of the Bible, which again, we will study at some point Leviticus. Look at these words. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great. Judge your neighbor fairly. See the links here? And then look at what this says a couple verses later. Don't seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your own people. So AKA the Israelites, but love your neighbor as yourself. Where have we heard those words before? Jesus, this is where he gets it. Jesus does not make up the greatest commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. He pulls it right here from Leviticus. So if this is about love your neighbor as yourself, who's your neighbor according to this verse? Your fellow Israelites, right? Okay, but hold on. We go down just a little ways to verse 33. When a foreigner resides among you in the land, by the way, you're also called to love them as yourself. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says you ought to love your neighbor as yourself, who's he talking about? He's quoting these two passages in Leviticus. Your, your neighbor being the Israelites among you. So the people in your inner circle. Oh, and by the way, every other person that there is. Isn't this amazing? Jesus is pulling this from right here. And we see the bones of this taking shape in Deuteronomy these laws, like we've been talking about, they're not random laws. God's heart for people to love one another, to build a nation of justice and fairness. We're starting to see that already take shape right here from the very first chapter of Deuteronomy. And we're going to see that um, expounded and built upon when we get to chapter 12 and we actually start reading the laws that they're putting in practice. Does this make sense? Look, we're 20 minutes in and we've made it 18 verses. We're, we're hey, doing Alex, yes. Alex, I have a question. The um the um spreading of the um workload basically mm -hmm. that we were just talking about, doesn't that go back to Jethro in Exodus? Yes, okay. yes. this is recounting that story. Yes. Absolutely. And there's some interesting things in there because Jethro's not mentioned here. But it was Jethro's idea, if I remember correctly. Just fun little not. It would be worth if you want to have some fun. Go read those two stories side by side and see if you can pick out the differences. And then try and figure out wh why would these this book with this audience not want to. This just a fun mental exercise. Um, okay, 
the next story that we're going to read about are the spies that are sent out um, into the land. This is recounting numbers 13 and 14. You can go read the original story there. And just like with Jethro, there are a couple of details that are not like line to line. So they set out from Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, and then um, God's going to tell them, go take possession of the land. Um, don't be afraid. I'm, I'm with you. I've got your back. And what is the very first thing that they say? Yes, God, we're going to do it. Let's go. No. Instead, they say, let, let us be sure. <laughs> we need to scope this situation out. We're going to go send some people ahead to see what is the real kind of scenario around here. And then we see a problem. Mo this is really subtle. Moses says, seems like a good idea to me. God has just said, go take possession. Not like dilly dally, go see if it's safe first. Trust me and just go do it. And here we see a subtle like starting of rebellion, not outright rebellion, but just a little wobble. Does that make, do you see it here? Just a little wobble. They, it's like um, when you're swimming and you know the pool is going to be cold. And so you dip your toe in to see just how cold it is. It's kind of like that. God wants them to just jump in and trust that he's going to take care of them. So Moses says, all right, sounds like a good idea. This is going to come back to bite them in a big way. And so they send the spies into the land and the spies come back and say, you guys, you won't believe it. It's awesome. Flowing with milk and honey. Th this is amazing. The problem is, and Deuteronomy kind of dances around it. Moses just summarizes it. The spies also come back and say, well, but the land is already occupied and the people there are gigantic. Listen to how they phrase this. Moses says, you rebelled, you rebelled. And we're going to come back to that you word here in just a second. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. He brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Now, does that sound like God? God saying, I'm going to be with you. Don't be afraid. And their first reaction is God wants to destroy us. Do you, say, do you see there might be a little bit of a problem here? They're not fully trusting that God is who he says he is, that he can be trusted. Um, so where can we go? The people are so strong and tall than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. The Anakites are there. Now, <laughs> we read this and we think, what are they talking about? But this yellow highlighted sentence or two is just loaded with Old Testament references. I mean, it would probably take us 30 minutes to go through all of them. So I'm going to do it fast. And then if you want more information on this, email me and I can send you um, a longer video that explains it in more detail. So where have we heard tale of a city whose walls reach up to the sky, this imposing city who's building all the way up to the sky. What What's going on in your brain? What story comes to mind? Tower of Babel. Jericho. Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. Is that a good story or a bad story? It's a uh, bad good. story. Sign of people wanting to make a name for themselves. Okay. Um, their cities are large. There's a whole video on the Bible Project about the city and the, the the metaphors that come along with the city. The people are strong and tall and the Anakites are there. Now, here's a fun rabbit trail. Some of you are not going to think that this is very fun. In Genesis 6, this is an inception move we're about to pull. We're going to go to one story, link to another story to get back to where we are. So just hang on for the ride, okay? In Genesis 6, there is this weird, seemingly random vignette about the sons of God, the Elo, the, the sons of the Elohim, basically. And I want you to think about this language as I read it. These sons of God are here and they see that the daughters of humans were beautiful. Another way to say that is they're desirable to their eyes. 
And so they marry any of them that they choose. In other words, they take what they want. Where, what does this remind you of this language? Where have you heard this before? They see what they want. The garden of Eden. The garden. This is the false story. Remember Eve sees that the fruit is desirable. And so she takes it for herself, what she wants. This is a false story. It's very subtle, but that's how false stories work in the Bible. This language of seeing something that's desirable and taking it for yourself. It immediately should put up alarm bells in your mind. Like, you know, um, what are the sirens that go off the red sirens, like in a submarine, like romp, romp, the ship is sinking. That's what this is meant to evoke in your mind. So you have these sons of God who are falling. And by the way, um, there's a case to be made that these are spiritual beings or at the very least um, demigods, part spiritual beings, part humans that, that have fallen. Long rabbit trail we do not have time for. But either way, listen to what God says. My spirit will not contend with humans forever for they are mortal. This is a bad translation. Um, he's not talking about humans here. The language is talking about these sons of God. My, I will not contend with these sons of God forever. They, the, this would better be translated for they too are human. In other words, these guys are going to be mortal again. I'm going to make their days, these sons of God, 120 years not all humanity. He's talking about these spiritual beings that he's now going to like bring out of the garden. Remember Eve and Adam are like ripped from the garden. They're ripped from having eternal life. Something similar is going on here, the same fall. And again, this is a hard connection to make in a class where we only have a limited amount of time. I can send you a video, but I need you to take my word for it for right now. When it talks about the Nephilim, this is not like a random new story. This is connecting to what just happened. It's like saying, dear reader, by the way, you know the Nephilim? They were around in these very days we just talked about when those sons of God went to daughters of humans and they had children. The Nephilim and the sons of God, one and the same. And this is a story about how they fell. And by the way, their fall had consequences because they had children. Okay, this is level inception one. Now we're jumping to level inception two. This one's a little easier. This is numbers 13. So right around the same stories we're dancing around. And this is what Israel says. We saw the Nephilim. They're descendants of Anak. Is this the nation we just heard about in Deuteronomy who come from the Nephilim? So Anak, the um, Anakites are descendants of the Nephilim. Oh, and we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. We're like bugs to them. They're so tall and mighty. Do you see what's going on here? When, when the Anakites are hopped up into this story where they go um when they specifically call out the anakites who are super high and tall they are doing all this work to link back to the stories we just talked about these are bad news bears people um tim mackey calls them snake bitten people those who have fallen who are not um they are not followers of God. They rebelled against God. And as a result, their, their nations have risen up and they're wicked. They don't know God. And oh my goodness, what are we going to do? How are we going to face these incredibly tall people who don't like us and who are not after the same mission? Th does this make sense? I want to pause here. How are we doing with this? Question. I have another thought? question. I do yeah. have a question. So the Anakites are second generation Nephil Nephilim. I, I don't know that I would call second generation because remember Genesis six was a long time ago, right? Okay. But, but it's fair to say descendants of in okay. the same line of. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What else? Alex, the other thing is I just saw when you were scrolling, this is right before Noah, right? In the flood. Yes. 
Um, which is gonna, when we talk about the conquest stories here in a minute, like keep that in mind, right? How did God deal? I've got too many tabs open. How did God deal with the Nephilim? They, they, the wickedness from this point on just goes to fever pitch. What does God have to do? Start over. Flood the earth. But he said he wasn't going to do that again. Over. Yeah. yeah. But he's not going to do that again. Mm. So now it's like we're setting the stage for, uh-oh, the flood, the pre-flood people are still there. There's still this potential for the world to, to descend back into chaos. Only this time, God's not going to use a flood to set things right. He's going to use people. And he's going to use people in ways that are surprising to us. But I think if we can sit with it for a little while, it will start to make sense. God is not after whole scale destruction. He's already said way back in Genesis, he's not doing that again. So whatever God is up to in the stories that we're going to read next, it is not about whole scale destruction, but we have to wrestle with what the stakes are. The stakes are there are snake bitten people who have the potential to lead the world into a chaotic wickedness that last time it happened resulted in the flood. So what are we going to do? God wants to destroy us because he's put these people in our path. So how are we going to make sense of all of this? And this is what, Mo this is how Moses makes sense of it. Don't be afraid. It's like easy for you to say, Moses, you didn't see these people in the land. He's the Lord, your God, who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. Oh, and in the wilderness where you just came from too. Um, this is just a beautiful passage. Like, yes, is darkness in the land? Does it look dire? Yeah, but don't be afraid because God is with you. God is going to be the one to fight for you. Okay. I promised I would go back to you. So we're going to like put on the brakes and reverse back over here. Um, who's he talking to? Who's this whole speech from Moses supposed to be to? Uh, the rebellious Israelite. Which generation though? Second, the second generation. They weren't involved in any of these stories. First generation. Want them to repeat. So how can he say you were unwilling to go up? They weren't even, they were like babies if they were even born at this time. This is one of the clues that this whole book is not meant to be written to one generation, but to all generations. He is talking to the second generation as if they were the ones who rebelled. And so again, every generation of Israelite who reads these words, what he wants them to do is see themselves in this place, reliving this story. Where have you rebelled? What would you do in the face of this wickedness? What would you be saying? Have you been unwilling to go up? Do you see what I'm saying here? Every generation of Israelite is going to need to picture themselves facing off against the forces of evil in the world. Um, when this was edited, many scholars believe it was during the time of the exile. Would this have meant something to them? Living in a foreign land with a power that seemed like giants to them? representing the wickedness of the earth. You see what I'm saying? This is a message for them to say, by the way, um, you're part of what got us here to the exile. And so you too are going to need to trust, not to be afraid and to remember how God brought you out of slavery and he's going to do it again. This is setting the stage of hope for every future generation. We're almost done with chapter one and then we're going to cruise through the rest. We'll see. Um, in spite of this, Moses says, this is like a repeat language. You did not trust. You didn't trust. And so the Lord's anger burns against them. And he said, no one from this generation shall, shall see the good land. So again, he's talking to the second generation and saying, this is the mistake that your parents made. They didn't trust God. They didn't believe that he would go with them. Oh, except for Caleb. Caleb was good. He was the spy that said, come on, we can do this. Caleb and Joshua. 
So the Lord becomes angry. Oh, and I, this is just a fun aside too. We're breezing through this fast. I'm sorry. Um, look at what Moses says in verse 37, because of you, the Lord became angry with me also and said, you shall not enter it either. Now, is this a fair representation of what happened? No, all you have to do is go and read this story in Numbers 20 um, and just look again at this language. The people are upset because there's no water. God tells Moses, take your staff, speak to that rock and water will come from it. What does Moses do? He makes two mistakes in my estimation. He says, listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? Who's he talking about? Himself and Aaron. No, no. Who was going to bring the water out of the rock? God. Moses is putting himself in God's place and Aaron alongside with him. You have to think Aaron was probably like, just leave me out of this right now. And then Moses struck the rock twice. You could make a case that Moses takes for himself what he wants in this situation. This is like Moses's false story. I think he puts himself in place of God and he, he does what's right in his eyes instead of listening to what God asked him to do. Does that make sense? So right here, um, Moses is being a little, uh, I just think generous in the language. Oh, it's y'all's fault <laughs> that the Lord became angry with me. And now I'm not even able to enter the land. So, okay, we keep on moving. Joshua is going to be able to enter it. God says, encourage him. He's going to lead uh, Israel to inherit it. We see that this pattern of when all the nation rebels, there is a remnant who stays faithful. This is a theme over and over again. Even though the whole first generation rebels, there are just a few people, the remnant who remains, the smaller number who are going to be able to carry the promise forward. And then we get this interesting line in verse 39, I think, um, by the way, your children who do not yet know good from not good, they will enter the land. What, what is this call back to knowing good and not good. The, the garden of it, uh, evil, yeah. good and evil. He's saying these are this is the generation that hasn't taken the fruit. Do you see the false stories all over this passage? Um, these are those who have not given into that temptation yet. Those are the ones who are going to enter the land. And it's so interesting that we see here Moses is not among them somehow some way like in the story we just read Moses is not one he he has taken the fruit he is not among the children okay we're going to try and speed things up a little bit um we get story after story of um God telling the people exactly what to do who to fight who not to fight and story after story of the people doing the exact opposite and not listening. I mean, this is what chapters two and three are all about. God says, go, don't provoke the people to war. Um, God is going to be with you. We see this language of God has um, been with the people this whole time. He has designated certain lands for Israel and certain lands for other nations. Esau is brought up, his descendants. Um, Moab, the descendant of Lot, is brought up. And we see this um, picture of God having governance over not just Israel, but the whole world. He's kind of putting all the puzzle pieces in place and he can move them at will as he desires. That's the picture that these two chapters paint for us. Um, here's another mention of those really tall Anakites again, those snake bitten people who descend from the Nephilim, strong and numerous, um, 38 years have gone by. Again, we see all of this time, the people not listening to what God is saying, where they're going, where, what they're supposed to do. And we come to the end ish, -ish of chapter two, this Sihon king of Heshbon. This is the story that was nodded to earlier. So 
Um, they're about to enter a battle with this king. And it's important to note that this was not the way it was meant to be. At first, God had wanted to bring the people through peacefully, right? Let us pass through your country, they said to the king. We'll stay on the road. We'll, we'll stay out of your way. Just sell us some food to eat, some water, and just let us pass through your land. And what happens? Shihon refuses. And so now God is going to do what God does and say, okay, that's fine, but now your land is forfeit. And so we get this story about how basically this is the start of the conquest. Um, she, Sihon is completely destroyed, including men, women, and children. We get this specific line, lest you have any doubt, we left no survivors. Here's where I want to pause for a second, and I want to spend some time kind of talking through this, and then I'm, my guess is that we'll have some questions on this. If you read this at face value, which we all should to some degree, um, there is no one left alive, correct? Men, women, children, that about covers it. And we really struggle with this. We call this conquest language, especially today in our modern you know, thinking and wisdom, this is not, this is yucky. We don't, we don't like this side of God, but I want to put forward to you what's happening here in the scriptures is not all that different than language that we use every single day. Um, I don't know how many of you are Rangers fans like I am, but if you saw the game today, there's really only one reaction you can have. I don't remember what the final score was, but it was like 15 to four, 15 to four. Um, what, how would you describe a game like that? What happened to the Rangers? They got slaughtered. They got, I mean, yeah, they were destroyed. D just saying that if the Cowboys won, you know, 50 to zero they murdered they just slaughtered them it was a massacre out there D does this language ring true now does that mean that the opposing team came out with swords and like killed everyone on the other team what's going is this on like a language? hyperbole yeah like a hyper this is hyperbolic language hyperbolic language and in, we should not be surprised by this because as I've just shown, we use this kind of language all the time. I'm so hungry. I could eat a horse. Are you going to eat a horse? No, you're not going to eat a whole horse. Hopefully you're not going to eat any of a horse. That's beside the point. What is going on here is not in my view, God saying literally destroy every person in these nations where you're going. What I see is God saying this culture of snake bitten people who are not going to listen to me and heed me, you need to cut them off. You need to um, end their influence in this places where you're going. Um, you know that this is true because later on in Deuteronomy, we are going to read about this very nation and the other ones we've already talked about. And we're going to see how they're supposed to cooperate in the land. If they destroyed them and left no survivors, how is that possible? It's not because this language is hyperbolic. The book of Joshua, one of the most hated books, I think in the Bible, because it has this kind of conquest language, you see, when you read it with these eyes, you will see it everywhere. One sentence will be, we completely destroyed them. No women, children alive. The very next verse is, okay, so with all of those who are left alive, here's what we do with them. How, those two things cannot be true at the same time. This does not mean that they didn't kill anyone and that they came in with gifts and were nice and friendly to the people. Absolutely not. This is war. War is taking place. This is why I said in the email, I can't make you feel completely comfortable with this from our modern standpoint, but it's important that we remember what we already talked about. At this point in human history, war is a common tool humans use. And 
the fate of the world is at stake. God is trying to do something in the world and he's got to root out. It's like the flood. He's not going to destroy it completely, but God is going to bring a flood of human conquest to try and do the same thing. And least you think that Israel gets like the plus side of this, just remember what will happen to Israel. We'll read about it in the later chapters of Deuteronomy, but God is going to warn them. By the way, everything that you're doing right now, this same fate will be yours if you do not listen and obey. And what happens? They don't listen, they don't obey, and in comes Babylon and exile. This is just, we don't understand it because it's not how we see the world and how we see things work. But at this point in history, and really only this point in history, um, this is how God operates in the world. This does not mean that it is a literal, you know, genocide at all. We're going to see God operate in the same way with his own people as he's inviting them to do here. If this is a topic for you that's really difficult, I want to recommend two resources. One is a book by Dan Kimball called How Not to Read the Bible. There's a whole section on this that was really helpful for me. And then the other would be the podcast from the Bible Project. It's the third one in the Deuteronomy series. I linked it in the email called um, Giants and Justice, I believe is the name. Two very helpful things for me. My goal is not to soften this and, you know, make it seem okay and like happy things are happening here. But I do think it's important that we put these passages in the context of what's going on, because if we don't read them through the lens of the first readers of this or who it was written for, we'll import our own views onto it and we won't understand what's trying to happen. Okay, so I'm I'm going to stop talking here for just a second. I want to hear from you guys, thoughts, questions, comments, reactions to this. How are we feeling? Okay, I have another question. Yes. Um, guess I'm going to be the spokesperson here. Uh, so the story in uh, Numbers where Moses strikes the rock, you know, my impression of this has always been he was not allowed to go into the promised land because he disobeyed and struck the rock. Mm -hmm. But now I'm thinking, no, he put himself in God's place. And that's what God was angry about, as much about as the disobedience, but because he he and he said, you know, look what you're done to, you know, or whatever to Aaron. Oh, you put it yeah. up there. Yeah. Um, where is it? It's yeah. Both. Yeah. Well, but I just think, you know, when you start trying to play God, you're you're really flirting with disaster. And yeah. but this is the first time I've thought about that. So mm -hmm. I really am excited. Yeah, he breaks the first commandment. Mm -hmm. idolatry have no other mm -hmm. gods before me mm -hmm. and then he breaks the second because he misrepresents god mm -hmm. god said speak he strikes it why does that mm -hmm. such an egregious thing yeah if you speak to a rock and water comes out of it there's no doubt in your mind what just happened that's a mm -hmm. miracle from god yeah. this could be misconstrued as something else especially with moses saying i'm the one doing this me and aaron me and my buddy um, yeah, I, this is, this is Moses's false story. Absolutely. What else? Alex, I, um, I, I've struggled with this before because I wondered, like, did we, we read this and I'm not convinced that Moses, you know, intentionally put himself in it. Like I sort oh, of, this is kind of an accidental, like, mm -hmm. oops. And I, so I, you know, it does seem kind of like a harsh reaction and it almost seems like after the fact we've had to come back and like you know dig through what happened to come up with something that he did that was horrendous enough to warrant the punishment that he got mm -hmm. but like it just it, I don't know it makes me feel like you got to be super super careful um and I don't know because like did Moses really was he really intending to to put himself equal with God that's a great question. And here's what I would kind of put in your ear for this one. Are there times that we put ourselves in place of God? Sure. Or we trust ourselves, right? Instead of trusting in God. Are, are those always intentional? No, no, not at all. 
there are times I do it out of anger. Um, and I think Moses is pretty, listen, you rebels, I think tells us a little bit about his mindset at the time when you're heightened. Um, this goes back to the Cain story. I know you're angry Cain, but remember sin is crouching like a lion waiting to devour you. This is that all over again. You can let it rule over you or you can rule over it. And what we see is Moses lets sin rule over him. He doesn't rule over his own emotions. And it may sound like it's like not a big deal, but Moses is number two. It's God, Moses, and the people. And I don't think this story is meant to highlight for us, oh, Moses is so bad because we've all had a false story like this. Every single one of us, right? This goes back into the gospel message. Romans, no one is capable of following entirely. What this story and the rest of Deuteronomy is going to start to highlight for us is the need for a leader who can do this. And what we're seeing tragically is that it's not Moses. Mm -hmm. Someone else needs to lead God's people in faithfulness. Moses can't do it. And that's the tragedy at the end of the book. Um, and really, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to the end of chapter three. There's this vignette, since we're already here, where Moses is saying, you know, God, please, please this breaks my heart. Let me go and see. Let, let me go with the people. Can I please go into the promised land? And again, Moses says, because of you people, the Lord was angry with me and would not listen. God says, I'm sorry, but no, you're not going to get to go. Instead, Joshua is coming. So it's almost this moment of, I'm so sorry, Moses. You don't get to be the one to lead God's people forward. We're going to try with someone else. And it's like the baton is passed to Joshua. And now Joshua holds this hope for someone like Moses to come and lead God's people into faithfulness. And how does Joshua do? Okay, for a time. Mm -hmm. But again, this is the story of Israel. Um, Joshua and the judges will be leader after leader after leader who show promise and then hard crash. And that's the story of Israel until we get to Jesus. And finally with Jesus, it's like this bright shining light where, oh, maybe he's a prophet like Moses who can lead God's people. This is what Matthew is all about. So that's a long-winded way of saying this is a tragedy, but it's a tragedy that's highlighted because it's meant to show us that we need someone to guide us. And it's not going to be any of the people we think it's going to be in the story. Does that help make sense? I think so. It's okay to say it doesn't. Well, <laughs> I have questions. I mean, I do think like to your point, I thought you were going to say it illustrates that we all, that, that none of us, um, mm -hmm can attain the standard God's standard and we're all in need of a savior because we inadvertently you know fall short and and um and I guess I, I hadn't remembered this before but I didn't remember him blaming everyone else it's because of you and I don't like that at all <laughs> I don't yeah. like lack of accountability because who does that harken back to this the woman Adam and Eve it. right she, she made me gave it to me yeah, yeah she gave it to me um what we're seeing at work is human nature yeah. as expressed. The Bible doesn't come out and say, humans always blame each other. It uses stories <laughs> like this to show you when you get angry, you better be really careful because you're susceptible to sin. That's yeah. when sin is crouching, waiting to devour you. Yeah, that's your a good next, point. Your next move is to, to point the finger at someone else yeah. instead of taking responsibility for your own actions. Yeah. yeah. What else? Thoughts, questions? Okay. Um, oh, Alex, this is Donna. Yes. Um, just one comment. So I use the Oxford Bi uh, Study Bible. And according to it, you know, this was not actually written by Moses. Mm -hmm. It was written much, much later. So if we were to look at it in that regard, that the author wants it to be Israel's fault. Mm-hmm you know, not just the one person sort of to make his point. Does that 
Does that fly? <laughs> so if I'm processing that out loud, it's the you people made Moses. Every generation has led their leaders astray. I don't know. Maybe. I think maybe I could get there with some time. What I see is more than anything, this this framing that happens here and the framing that happens in um, chapter 34, we've already looked at this one, but 34 is the death of Moses. And um, what are the last words? Or is it? There's one where it says, oh, here it is. Since then, no, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses. This is how we're going to leave the book of Deuteronomy. Spoiler alert. This is how we leave the book of Deuteronomy craving a leader like Moses. And so I think what we're meant to see is that we're waiting for someone like Moses, but who's even greater than. And um, during the exile, do we have other books that have, you know, being compiled at the same time that are speaking to the need for Israel to have a leader greater than Moses? Oh yeah, this is what the prophets are all about. So I think we're seeing those threads being woven together. We're craving a prophet like Moses, who who is who can do what Moses set out to do, but failed to do because he was human like everyone else. Thank Alex, you. Yes. This is Linda. And I just I I just wanted to um I think that the Bima podcast mm -hmm. it really, really clarified the point that you just made. And I, I really enjoyed listening to it. And it, and it clearly, it clearly points yeah. in the direction that you just said. So I would highly recommend if you get a moment to see it, I, I would, I would watch that one. Yeah. They're probably, they're way more articulate than I am. And Marty and, um, oh, I know his name, Marty, Brent. Rick, Brent. Brent Billings, Brent, Marty and Brent. Um, they are seeped in very Old Testament um, from the Jewish lens. They're not going to bring Jesus in as much as I, not because they don't believe it, because they want the the book to say what it was said to the original readers first and foremost. So they're really good if you want that lens of, of these stories. It's 801. Questions, thoughts, con we touched on the end of chapter three. There's not much I want to add to this other than what we already have said and what's in the email. Um, we're not going to go verse for verse through Deuteronomy. I just want to use our time to point out these big themes like what we've done. So thoughts, questions, comments that we didn't get to or that you saw in the text that you want to kind of raise up to the group. Alex, I'm also happy you put in that link to the Bible project going into the hardening of the heart. Because yes. it was back to what um, who was that Elizabeth when you were talking about earlier that it's you know when you get into that genocide space so to speak it's it's tough but then when you start looking at it from your own personal perspective uh, you know there are days where I'm sure I, I I'm I'm causing the genocide you know? yeah 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 absolutely yeah yeah my hope is. Uh, to take fewer rabbit trails in the email if a good article already exists that explain it. So um, that that's just the the plan. Anything else before we call wrap a bow on this one? Um, okay, we are still in the same kind of section working through chapter four and then the first part of chapter five um, next week. Email me with questions if you have them. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but I we're in the thick of it now. This is this is the fun part. So, is there anyone who'd be willing to pray for us to close our time tonight? Sandy, I will. Okay, thank yeah, you. I will. And here's what I'm going to do because you've challenged us, um, Alex, for um, the month of September as we're focusing mm -hmm. on cultivating a life with God. You've asked us to, um, in a daily uh, part, to go and pray the St. Francis of Assisi each day. So if you don't mind if I share that. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay, thank you. Bow your heads. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is doubt, faith. 
where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. We'll see you back here next week. Thank you. Thank you. Happy reading.